Hello, I am going to be reading chapters two and three of The Count of Monte Cristo by Alexander Dumas, and I will be going over vocabulary and things you need to know before the two chapters and then reading the two chapters. Chapter two, insinuation. An insinuation is something that is insinuated, and something that is insinuated is strongly like hinted at contraband contraband is illegally obtained objects gratitude is thankfulness husky means solid physically broad-shouldered muscular ardent means very powerful and serious chapter three vocabulary barren means unable to produce crops as as in land a promontory is a cliff jutting out over the sea a gypsy is a person who is part of ethnic group called the gypsies and they travel from place to place marry among themselves like a normal culture it's just they don't have a country to call their own steadfast means it doesn't give in or give up so like sturdy almost inquiring means it's a way to describe something that's giving inquiry inquiry is asking questions so if something is described as inquiring it looks as though it's asking a question imperious the root word of this is imperial which is related to royalty and the power of royalty so an imperious something would be something that acts kingly or queenly like they have power and that they're justified feeling that way dejected means sad hurt restrain means to hold back and tenacity means good ability things to know before reading is that cousins often married in the 19th century it was considered normal and it was a way to keep wealth in the family i know it's strange but white teeth a traditional symbol for being cunning this is why in cartoons it usually shows like a used car salesman or someone who's going to trick someone else has a huge flashy white smile you also need to pay attention to the direct characterization and the actions or indirect characterization in this chapter these chapters and then also pay attention to what shadows light and clouds do in these chapters alexander dumas loves these things and it shows us who's good and evil and how a character is feeling chapter two let us leave Danglars, possessed by the demon of hatred and trying to breathe some evil insinuation against his comrade into the ship owner's ear, and follow Dante's, who after having walked the entire length of the Canterbury, turned into the Rue de Noé, entered a small house on the left side of the Alley de Mion, ran up four flights of dark stairs, and stopped before a half-open door which revealed the interior of a little room. It was the room in which his father lived. Father, my dear father. The old man uttered a cry and turned around and then fell into his son's arms, trembling and pale. What's the matter, father? exclaimed the young man anxiously. Are you ill? No, no, Edmond, my son, my child. No, but I wasn't expecting you in the joy of suddenly seeing you like this. They say joy never harms anyone, so I came straight here as soon as I landed. I've come back safely and we're going to be happy together. That's wonderful, my boy, said the old man. But how are we going to be happy? Do you mean that you're not going to leave me anymore? Tell me about your good fortune. May God forgive me for rejoicing in the good fortune brought about by another man's death, but it's happened and I don't have the strength to regret it. Captain Leclerc is dead and it looks as though I'm going to take his place. Can you imagine that, Father? A captain at the age of 20 with a salary of a hundred Louis plus a share in the profits. Isn't that really more than a poor sailor like me could ever hope for? Yes, my son, you're very lucky. 
And with the first money I earn, I want to buy you a little house with a garden. What's the matter, father? You don't look well. It's nothing. It will pass, said the old man. But his strength failed, and he fell backward. You need a glass of wine, said Edmund. That will make you feel better. Where do you keep your wine? I don't need any, said the old man, trying to hold back his son. Yes, you do, said Edmund. Just tell me where it is. He opened two or three cupboards. Don't bother looking. There's no more wine. No more wine, exclaimed Edmund, turning pale and looking alternately at his father's hollow cheeks and the empty cupboards. Have you been short of money, father? I don't need anything now that you're here. But but I gave you 200 francs when I left three months ago, stammered Edmund. Yes, that's true, Edmund. But you forgot a little debt you owed to our neighbor, Caderousse. He reminded me of it and told me that if I didn't pay it for you, he'd go to see Monsieur Morel about it. I was afraid that might do you harm, so I paid him. But I owed Caderousse 140 francs. Did you give it to him out of the 200 francs I left you? The old man nodded. You lived for three months on 60 francs, exclaimed Edmund. May God forgive me. It doesn't matter now that you're here. Yes, I'm here now with a good future before me and a little money already. Here, father, take this and send for some things right away. He emptied the contents of his pockets onto the table. A dozen pieces of gold, five or six five franc coins, and some small change. The old man's face brightened. Whose is that? He asked. It's mine, yours, ours. Take it and buy provisions. And don't worry, tomorrow there will be more. Also, I have some contraband coffee and some excellent tobacco for you on the ship. You'll have it tomorrow. Listen, I hear someone is coming. It's probably Caderousse coming to welcome you back from your trip. More lips that say one thing while the heart thinks another, muttered Edmund. Just the same, though. He's a neighbor who once did us a favor, so he's welcome here. A moment later, Caderousse entered. He was a man of about 25, with black hair and beard. He was holding a piece of cloth, which, being a tailor, he intended to turn into the lining of a coat. So you're back, Edmond, he said in a heavy Marseille accent, with a broad grin in which revealed his white teeth. Yes, I'm back and ready to be of service to you in any way I can, replied Edmond, scarcely concealing his coldness beneath these polite words. Thank you, but fortunately I don't need anything. In fact, other people sometimes need me, Edmond started. Oh, I'm not talking about you, continued Caderousse. I lent you some money and you paid it back. So now we are quits. We are never quits with those who have done us a favor, said Edmund. Even when we are no longer owing them money, we still owe them gratitude. Why talk about that? What's past is past. Let's talk about your return, my boy. I ran across our friend Danglars down at the harbor and he told me about it. He also told me you have a high place in Monsieur Morel's favor now but you shouldn't have refused his invitation for dinner. If a man wants to become a captain, it is always a good idea to flatter his ship owner a little. I hope to become a captain without that. So much the better. All your old friends will be glad to see you succeed, and I know someone else who won't be at all sorry to hear about it. Do you mean Mercedes? asked the old man. Yes, father, said Edmund. And now that I've seen you, now that I know you're well and have everything you need with your permission... I'll go see Mercedes. He embraced his father, nodded to Caderousse, and went out. Caderousse remained for a moment, then took his leave of Edmund's father, went downstairs, and met Danglars, who was waiting for him. Well, said Danglars, did he talk to you about his hope of becoming captain? He talked as though it had already happened, and it's already made him elegant. He offered his services to me as though he were a great man. Is he still in love with Mercedes? Head over heels. He's on his way to see her now, but unless I'm mistaken, he's in for an unpleasant surprise. What do you mean? I don't know much for sure, but I do know that every time Mercedes comes into town, she's accompanied by a husky young Catalan with an ardent expression on his face. You say Dantes is on his way to see her now? Asked Anglars. Yes, he left just before I did. Then let's go in the same direction. We'll stop at La Reserve and wait for the news over a bottle of wine. Who's going to tell us any news? 
We'll be beside the road and we can tell what's happened from the expression on Dante's face. Let's go then, said Caderousse. But you'll pay for the wine, won't you? Certainly, replied Danglars. The two friends walked rapidly away. Chapter three. A hundred paces or so from the spot where Danglars and Caderousse sat sipping their wine was the village of the Catalans. One day, a mysterious group of people set out from Spain and settled on the narrow strip of land, which they still inhabit today. Their leader, who could speak a little Provençal, asked the commune of Marseille to give them the barren promontory on which they had run their boats ashore. The request was granted, and three months later, those seagoing gypsies has, had built a small village. Today, three or four centuries later, they still remain faithful to their little promontory and do not mix with the population of Marseille. They marry only among themselves and preserve the customs and language of their original homeland. In one of the houses on the only street of this little village, a beautiful young girl with jet black hair and eyes as soft as those of a gazelle was standing leaning against the wall. Before her sat a young man of about 20, tilting his chair nervously and looking at her with a mixture of uneasiness and anger. His eyes were questioning her but her firm, steadfast gaze dominated him. Listen, Mercedes, said the young man. It's almost Easter again, a good time for a wedding. Give me an answer. I've already answered you a hundred times, Fernand. You must be your own enemy to keep on asking me. I've never encouraged your hopes. I've always said to you, I love you like a brother, but never ask anything more of me because my heart belongs to someone else. Haven't I always told you that, Fernand? Yes. You've always been cruelly frank with me. Besides, why should you want to marry me, a poor orphan girl whose only fortune is a cabin that's falling into ruin? I don't care how poor you are, Mercedes. I'd rather have you than the daughter of the proudest shipowner or the richest banker in Marseille. All a man needs is an honorable wife and a good housekeeper. Where could I find anyone better than you in both respects? Fernand, replied Mercedes, shaking her head. A woman becomes a bad housekeeper and can't even guarantee to remain an honorable wife if she loves someone other than her husband. Be satisfied with my friendship. It's all I can promise you, and I never promise anything I'm not sure of being able to give. Fernand stood up, paced back and forth for a few moments, and then stopped in front of her, clenching his fists and scowling. Tell me once more, Mercedes, he said. Is this your final answer? I love Edmond Dantes, replied the girl coldly, and no other man will ever be my husband. And you will always love him as long as I live. Fernand bowed his head in despair and heaved a sigh, which sounded like a groan. Then suddenly looking up, he hissed between his teeth. What if he dies? If he dies, so will I. What if he forgets you? Mercedes, shouted a joyful voice outside the house. Ah, cried the girl, blushing with happiness and love. You see, he hasn't forgotten me. There he is now. She ran to the door, opened it, and called out. Here I am, Edmond. Fernand recoiled as though he had seen a snake and sank down again into his chair. Edmond and Mercedes fell into each other's arms. The fierce Marseille sun shining in through the door covered them with a flood of light. At first, they saw nothing around them. Their overwhelming happiness isolated them from the rest of the world. Then Edmund suddenly became aware of a somber face glaring at him out of the shadows. Fernand had unconsciously put his hand to the handle of the knife at his belt. Excuse me, said Dantes. I didn't realize that there were three of us. Turning to Mercedes, he asked, who is this gentleman? He'll be your friend, Edmond, because he's my friend. He's my cousin, Fernand, the man I love most in the world after you. Don't you recognize him? Ah, oh, yes, said Edmund. Keeping Mercedes' hand clasped in his, he held out his other hand to Fernand. But Fernand remained as motionless and silent as a statue. Edmund looked inquiringly at Mercedes, who was trembling and upset, then at Fernand, who scowled threateningly. He saw everything at a glance. His face darkened with anger. I didn't expect to find an enemy in your house when I hurried here to see you, he said. An enemy, cried Mercedes, with an indignant look at her cousin. You have no enemy here. Fernand is like a brother to me. He's going to shake hands with you in friendship. 
She looked imperiously at Fernand, who, as though hypnotized, slowly held, held out his hand to Edmund. Like a furious yet powerless wave, his hatred had broken against the command which the girl exercised over him. But as soon as he touched Edmund's hand, he knew he had done everything that was within his power. He turned abruptly and rushed out of the house. Oh, he cried, running like a madman and clutching his head between his hands. How can I get rid of him? What can I do? What can I do? Where are you going in such a hurry, Fernand? Called out a voice. He stopped short, looked around and saw Danglars sitting at a table with Caderousse in the arbor of a tavern. Well, said Caderousse, why don't you come on over? Are you in such a hurry that you don't have time to talk to your friends? Especially when they have a full bottle of wine in front of them, added Danglars. Fernand looked at the two men with a dazed expression on his face and said nothing. He seems dejected, remarked Danglars, nudging Caderousse with his knee. Could we be wrong? Could it be that Dantes has won out over him after all? Maybe so, replied Caderousse. We'll see. Turning to Fernand, he said, Well, come on, make up your mind. Fernand wiped away the sweat streaming down his forehead and walked slowly into the arbor. Hello, he said. You called me, didn't you? He sat down, slumped forward on the table, and let out a groan that was almost a sob. You know what, Fernand, said Caderousse. You look like a rejected lover. He accompanied this little jest with a coarse laugh. What are you talking about, said Danglars. A handsome young man like Fernand is never unlucky in love. You must be joking, Caderousse. No, I'm not. Just listen to the way he is sighing. Come on, Fernand, look up and talk to us. It's impolite not to answer your friends when they ask about your health. My health is fine, said Fernand clenching his fists, but still not raising his head. Ah, oh, you see, Danglars, said Caderousse, winking at his friend. This is how things are. Fernand here, who is a brave Catalan and one of the best fishermen in Marseille, is in love with a pretty girl named Mercedes, but unfortunately, she's in love with the first mate of the Ferron. Now, since the Ferron put into port today, well, you understand. No, I don't understand, said Danglars. For Fernand has been dismissed, continued Caderousse. And what if I have, said Fernand, raising his head and looking at Caderousse like a man searching for someone on whom to vent his anger. Mercedes is free to love anyone she wants to, isn't she? Ah, uh, if you take it like that, said Caderousse. That's another story. I thought you were a Catalan. I've always heard that a Catalan was not a man to let himself be pushed aside by a rival. And I've always heard that Fernand Mondego, especially, Terrible in his vengeance. Poor fellow, exclaimed Danglars, pretending to pity the young man from the bottom of his heart. He didn't expect Dantes to come back like this without warning. He thought he might be dead or unfaithful. A thing like that is always more painful when it happens suddenly. Well, in any case, said Caderousse, who kept drinking as he spoke and on whom the wine was beginning to have an effect. Fernand isn't the only one to be annoyed by Dante's happy return, is he, Danglars? No, that's true, and I almost might say that it will bring him bad luck. It doesn't matter, though. In the meantime, at least, he'll be marry the beautiful Mercedes. Danglars looked scrutinizingly at Fernand, on whom Caderousse's words fell like drops of molten lead. When will the wedding be? he asked. Oh, it hasn't taken place yet, muttered Fernand. No, but it will said Caderousse, just as surely as Dantes will be made captain of the Ferron, isn't that right, Danglars? Danglars started at this unexpected thrust and turned to look at Caderousse in order to see if it had been premeditated, but he saw nothing but envy in his drunken face. All right, then, he said, filling up the glasses. Let's drink to Captain Edmund Dantes, husband of the beautiful Mercedes. Caderousse raised his glass with a heavy hand and emptied it at one gulp. Fernand took his and dashed it to the ground. Well, well, exclaimed Caderousse. What do I see there on the top of the hill? Take a look, Fernand. You can see better than I can. I think my eyes are starting to blur. You know how treacherous wine is. It seems to me I see two lovers walking alone, hand in hand. May God forgive me. They don't know we can see them and they're kissing. <laughs> None of the anguish visible in Fernand's face escaped Danglars. Do you know them, Fernand? He asked. 
Yes, said Fernand Dolly. It's Dantes and Mercedes. Ah, cried Caderousse. You see, I can't even recognize them. Hey, Dantes. Hey, young lady. Come over here a moment and tell us when the wedding's going to be. Fernand's so stubborn, he won't tell us. Be quiet, said Danglars, pretending to restrain Caderousse, who, with the tenacity of the drunk, was leaning outside the arbor. Try to stand up and leave the lovebirds to their lovemaking. Look at Fernand. He's acting sensibly. Danglars looked at the two men and thought, these fools are useless to me. One of them's a drunkard and the other's a coward. I'm afraid Dante's good luck is going to hold out. He'll marry the girl, become captain of the Ferran, and have the laugh on all of us unless a smile passed over his lips. Unless I take a hand in things. Hey there, Caderousse continued to shout, half erect and leaning on the table. Edmond, don't you see your friends or are you too proud to talk to them? Not at all, Caderousse, replied Dantes. I'm not proud, but I'm happy, and I think happiness makes a man even blinder than pride. That's a very good excuse, said Caderousse. Hello there, Madame Dantes. That's not my name yet, replied Mercedes gravely. And they say it brings bad luck to call a girl by the name of her fiancé before she's married. So please call me Mercedes. I suppose the wedding will take place very soon, won't it, Monsieur Dantes? Said Danglars, bowing to the young couple. As soon as possible, Monsieur Danglars. Today, all the preliminaries will be arranged at my father's house, and tomorrow, or the day after at the latest, we'll have the brutal feast here at the tavern. All our friends will be there, which means you're invited, Monsieur Danglars, and you too, Caderousse. And what about Fernand? asked Caderousse with a dull laugh. Is he invited to? My wife's friend is my friend, answered Dantes, and we deeply regret it if he were absent from such an occasion. Fernand opened his mouth to reply, but his voice died in his throat, and he was unable to utter a single word. The preliminaries today, and the betrothal feast tomorrow or the next day, exclaimed Danglars. You're certainly in a hurry, Captain. Mr. Danglars, said Dante, smiling, let me tell you the same thing Mercedes told Caderousse just now. Don't give me a title that doesn't belong to me yet. It might bring me bad luck. Excuse me, replied Danglars. I only meant to say that you seem to be in quite a hurry. If there's plenty of time, it will be a good three months before the Ferran puts to sea again. A man is always in a hurry to be happy. But in this case, it's not only because of selfishness. I must go to Paris. Oh, really? Do you have business there? Not on my own account. Our poor Captain Leclerc asked me to do something for him there. As you can understand, it's a sacred duty. But don't worry, I'll come straight back. Yes, I understand, said Danglars. Then he thought to himself, he's probably going to Paris to deliver the letter the marshal gave him. By God, that letter gives me an idea, an excellent idea. Ah, oh, Dantes, my friend, you've not yet entered the Ferrand's log as number one. Then, as Dantes began to walk away, he called out, Bon voyage! Thank you, replied Dantes, turning around and giving him a friendly nod. The two lovers went on their way as blissful as two souls rising up to heaven.